74,000 years ago, in Indonesia, a gigantic volcanic eruption shook the Earth. It blasted a cloud of volcanic ash out to a distance of 3,000 kilometers and triggered a global volcanic winter. The crater left behind by this eruption was larger than the city of London. This was no ordinary eruption. It was a super eruption. At the time, the human race was in its infancy with just a few thousand people occupying the planet. But what if the next super eruption occurred in the heart of a country that's home to 300 million people? If we see one of these huge cataclysmic events today, particularly in an industrialized country, for example, an, another super eruption at Yellowstone, then the effects would be devastating, not only for that country, but for the, the whole planet. If a super eruption happened tomorrow, the consequences could be catastrophic. An area the size of a continent would be completely devastated, and there would be global effects for years afterwards. By consulting with leading geologists and volcanologists from research institutes all around the world, this program asks the question, how likely is it that the Yellowstone supervolcano will erupt in our lifetime? And what would the warning signs be? When most people think about volcanoes, they think about ones like Mount St. Helens. In 1980, it reawakened after lying dormant for over 120 years. With the explosive power of one Hiroshima bomb every second, it blasted a huge cloud of volcanic debris 20 kilometers high into the atmosphere. And obliterated the surrounding landscape. It was the most violent eruption in modern American history. Nearly 25 years later, the area still hasn't recovered. But this is nothing compared with the devastation that could be unleashed by a super eruption. A super eruption is the world's biggest bang. It's a volcanic explosion big enough to dwarf all others and with a reach great enough to affect everyone on the planet. Apart from scale, another characteristic that sets supervolcanoes apart is their invisibility. Normal volcanoes have a classic cone shape. And Mount St. Helens is an excellent example of that. Supervolcanoes, on the other hand, are very flat-lying structures. They're very difficult to detect, and we may not even know they're there. Supervolcanoes are best detected after they've erupted, when the underground chamber of molten rock collapses, leaving behind a crater in the ground called a caldera. So vast are these calderas that they can often only be identified from space. Supervolcanoes have been found in Indonesia, where the world's most recent super eruption took place, in New Zealand, and in South America. There are even very ancient calderas in Britain. But like most supervolcanoes, 
they're long extinct. One of the exceptions, however, is the Yellowstone supervolcano. Yellowstone is America's most famous and popular national park. Over three million visitors are drawn here every year to admire the biggest collection of hydrothermal features on the planet. What few people realize, however, is that this spectacular display is powered by a potentially deadly force that lies just a few kilometers beneath their feet. There is such a tremendous collection because this is, after all, sitting on top of a large reservoir of magma. It heats the rocks, it heats the waters, and it fuels the system. I should think people going to Yellowstone on holiday or vacation would be really surprised to know that they were walking in a volcano which was close to 100 kilometers across. Today, the Yellowstone supervolcano, even in its dormant state, is an extremely hazardous and volatile environment. The huge reservoir of magma beneath the ground heats the overlying water, giving rise to the boiling hot springs, geysers, and mud pots that injure and kill unsuspecting tourists every year. Then, of course, there's the ever-present threat of a future volcanic eruption. An eruption that could be anything from a small flow of lava to the biggest and most explosive eruption of them all. If we look at the recent eruptive history of Yellowstone, there were small eruptions maybe every 20 to 30,000 years. Now, we haven't seen anything for 70,000, and that might, might tell you something was overdue. It's also certain that there's going to be another super eruption somewhere on the planet. Whether there'll be another one at Yellowstone is still questionable. There's a reasonable chance there will be. They will, in fact, have occurred throughout Earth history. They're not going to stop occurring just because we've appeared on the scene. Because the world's last super eruption occurred over 70,000 years ago, it's difficult to know what to expect from the next one. Intriguingly, it was archaeologists working in the town of Orchard in Nebraska who first discovered evidence of just how devastating super eruptions can be. They unearthed the skeletons of hundreds of prehistoric animals who lay buried in a thick blanket of volcanic ash. When scientists eventually traced the eruption that had killed the animals, they had a shock. The volcano responsible was at a place called Bruno Jarbridge in Idaho, an astonishing 1,600 kilometers away from the fossil bed in Nebraska. The disturbing thing is, the power that fueled the Bruno Jarbridge eruption is now fueling the volcanic system under Yellowstone National Park. Many of the world's volcanoes are located around the margins of the tectonic plates which make up the rigid outer carapace of the planet. But Yellowstone's a little bit different. Yellowstone is sitting above what's called a hot spot. And here you have um, hot material from the Earth's mantle coming upwards, hitting the base of the Earth's crust and melting it. The hot spot is a fixed point deep within the Earth's interior, over which the North American plate slowly moves. It melts the overlying crust to create a huge chamber of molten rock, or magma, which eventually accumulates to produce a super eruption. Over millions of years, these super eruptions 
have left a trail of calderas on the Earth's crust. Bruno Jarbridge is one of them. Over two million years ago, the hotspot arrived beneath Yellowstone, and a new cycle of super eruptions began. As the scientist in charge of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, Jake Lowenstern is an expert in the park's volcanic potential. Across the valley, we see this snow-clad range. It's a Gallatin range. And these are rocks that are far older than the Yellowstone volcano itself. When you get to the south end of the range, that's where the caldera begins for the 2.1 million year old eruption. There's an enormous gap in the mountain range where it crosses the caldera formed by the first super eruption. For years, scientists couldn't work out why. It appears that what happened is that the range did exist during that time and that it was essentially swallowed up during formation of the caldera 2.1 million years ago. So the mountains essentially disappeared. An eruption capable of swallowing an 80 kilometer stretch of mountains is beyond anything we've ever witnessed before. Since then, there have been two more super eruptions at Yellowstone. 1.3 million years ago and 640,000 years ago. Disturbingly, these eruptions appear to be on a cycle of between 600 to 700,000 years. And the last one was 640,000 years ago. Could another be imminent? It's actually very difficult to say for sure what's happening underneath a, a volcano like Yellowstone. It could be that the next super eruption on is another 100,000 years from now, or it could be tomorrow. If an eruption were brewing at Yellowstone, what would the warning signs be? Norris Geyser Basin is one of Yellowstone's most popular tourist attractions. In the summer of 2003, strange things started to happen here. Ground temperatures soared to boiling point. Several geysers started to erupt more frequently, and a new series of vents opened up, spewing out scorching volcanic gases. A closure was put into place immediately over the uh, uh, area that had uh, the new thermal feature that was spewing uh, boiling temperature acidic mud onto the trail, so we viewed that it was unsafe for visitors to be walking through the area. Trees were starting to die. The trail was looking very, very different because steam was actually condensing on the surface of the trail. These strange events also appear to have an effect on the local wildlife. And just about... Um, a little bit more than a half mile or kilometer behind me, five bison, all within about 45 meter radius of each other, that were just falling over dead right where they stood. And so it turned into a bit of a mystery. Scientists descended onto the area to try to work out what was going on.
We went there and started looking at the geology and measured very, very high levels of hydrogen sulfide. And then when Jake was out here earlier this summer, he measured some extremely high concentration levels of carbon dioxide. Their test results pointed to the bison dying of gas poisoning, and hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide are both gases found in magma. Could magma have escaped from the chamber and be making its way to the surface? There's another, more obvious sign that magma is rising. Prior to eruptions, we're looking for ground deformation, movement of the ground upwards. It indicates that magma is rising towards the surface and deforming the rock as it goes. To keep track of ground movement at Yellowstone, scientists use GPS instruments and a new highly advanced technique called INSAR. INSAR is a satellite-based technology you're looking at the distance between the satellite and a point on the ground. You take one image, and then you can compare it to another image taken at a different time. And by comparing those two images, you can see how much each point in the ground has moved with respect to the satellite. When scientists analyzed the INSAR data for the Norris Basin, they were surprised. One of the scientists here looked at the data and compared it with earlier year, 1996, and saw that there had been some uplift in the northern part of the Yellowstone caldera, centered around here, not far from the Norris Geyser Basin. And this was unusual because it was a different area than we'd ever witnessed uplift in before. Their data showed that over the last seven years, the ground at Norris had been steadily uplifting. Should they be worried? There are at least two possibilities for why we might get uplift at Norris. And one possibility is that somewhere deep in the system, 10 to 15 kilometers, there is a small injection of magma that's pushing rock out of the way and causing some uplift. Another possibility is that gas buildup is causing some of the uplift, and that gas could either be coming from the magma or from the hydrothermal systems. If you take the phenomena going on at Norris, it could be that magma is moving, but it'll never reach the surface, so this activity will die down. That's a very common situation. It could be that magma will reach the surface at some stage and will get a, a small eruption. Or, of course, it's at least possible that if magma reached the surface, we could go into a much bigger eruption. Norris is not the only area of the park that's been causing concern. In 1999, a team of scientists from the US Geological Survey began a detailed study of the floor of Yellowstone Lake. One striking new feature in particular caught their attention. It was a 700-meter-long bulge, which rose 30 meters above the lake floor. They called it the Inflated Plain. To get a better look at this new feature, they used a remotely operated camera. Their images revealed that the sediments resting on the top of the bulge showed signs of disturbance, an indication that it could be swelling. What we're seeing at the moment is this so-called inflated plain, which is a sort of up-domed area beneath Yellowstone Lake. Now, that may at some point in the future herald a hydrothermal explosion. Which is a steam-driven blast. It will only affect the immediate area. Um, or it may subside, or it may just stay as it is. It's really impossible to say what's going to happen. Hydrothermal explosions can indicate that a volcano is stirring. However, they've occurred throughout Yellowstone's history without triggering eruptions. The thing about Yellowstone is it's a restless caldera, and that 
means that it's always doing something. So you have clearly have magma down there. It's heating groundwater. That's giving you the geysers, the hot mud pools, etc. It's also inflating the ground surface, which is going up and down over periods of decades or centuries. But this activity is not unusual for Yellowstone. The difficulty for scientists is that many of the signs they rely on to predict eruptions at other volcanoes occur all the time at Yellowstone. There's another warning sign, however, that scientists can't ignore. Magma's actually formed tens of kilometers beneath the surface, if not below that. To get from there to the surface, it has to make a path for itself, and it does that by breaking rock. And that breaking the rock generates earthquakes, and we can detect those, so we know the magma's on its way up. There are many earthquakes at Yellowstone. It's a very seismically active region. There are anywhere between about 1,000 and 3,000 earthquakes here in any given year. Most of the earthquakes are so small that they can only be detected by seismometers. But there can be exceptions. One of America's worst series of earthquakes in this century fell throughout the Northwest. In Medicine River Canyon, 50 million tons of earth and rock. The top of an 8,000-foot mountain thundered across a forest campground in one of the biggest landslides. Helicopters rescued 300 campers who were trapped between the Titanic slide and Hebgen Dam. At least 60 are known injured, mostly vacationers, with at least a dozen fatalities. The grim search for victims or survivors continues throughout the area as evacuation of those who did escape proceeds. The earth trembles, and to one of America's favorite vacation lands comes devastation and terror. Although the Hebgen Lake earthquake was devastating, it could have been so much worse. Because earthquakes of magnitude 7 and higher have the power to trigger eruptions. At other volcanoes around the world, people have found a correlation between large earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. That may have happened in the past at Yellowstone, in the distant past, and it potentially could happen in the future. Large earthquakes pose a risk because they can fracture the heart of the volcano, the magma chamber, and allow its contents to escape. Understanding what's going on inside the magma chamber is the only reliable way to predict the behavior of the volcano. The magma chamber is really the, the fundamental cause. It's at the heart of the process of leading up to an eruption. And that's why scientists really need to understand what's going on at depth below the volcano. To build up an image of the magma chamber, Professor Bob Smith is harnessing the many earthquakes that take place at Yellowstone. using a network of seismometers positioned all around the park. The seismographs provide the data of waves passing through the Earth, and seismologists use that data as a window. That is, we're looking down into the Earth to get a three-dimensional image. Earthquakes generate sound waves which travel slower through the hot material inside the magma chamber than they do through the cold surrounding rock. By measuring the different times taken for waves to reach the seismographs, Bob has revealed the size of the magma chamber. The volume of Yellowstone's magmatic system is about 20 to 25,000 cubic kilometers. It's about 80 kilometers long 40 kilometers wide and 8 kilometers deep. In other words, the magma chamber is over three times the size of New York City. But size alone doesn't dictate the possibility of a super eruption. Many people might think that Yellowstone would be underlain by a huge volume of uh, molten rock. 
uh, oh, that's not really quite the case because seismic studies underneath Yellowstone show that in actual fact the liquid rock is distributed between solid rock and there may be no more than 30% of liquid rock. What you need for a supervolcanic eruption is for that liquid uh, rock to separate and form a large layer of uh, almost pure liquid uh, right at the top of the chamber and that's when you can get uh, super conditions for a supervolcanic eruption. To qualify as a super eruption, 1,000 cubic kilometers of magma needs to be erupted. Yellowstone's magma chamber contains around five times that amount. So, is the molten rock at the top of the chamber? Frustratingly, this is one question scientists can't currently answer. When we're trying to find out exactly where the molten rock is underground, the images we get of the magma chamber are uh, very inexact. So we don't really know in detail of how this molten rock is distributed. And we can't exclude, of course, at the moment, there aren't uh, some pockets of purely molten rock uh, which could erupt. Although there's more than enough molten rock to fuel another super eruption, statistically, it's much more likely that the next eruption will be a small or moderate one. I don't think that the signs that the scientists are monitoring now are any evidence that a, a super eruption is imminent. Far more likely that if there is an eruption, it'll be on a small scale, perhaps comparable to Mount St. Helens. The Yellowstone scientists don't believe that even a small eruption is brewing. The kinds of things that we see have been going on ever since people have been coming to the park, and geologic evidence seems to indicate that they've been going on for at least the last 10,000 years. So at this point in time, we don't really see indications from ground deformation, from earthquakes, or from gas that there's any sort of really unusual activity going on at Yellowstone that would be precursor to a volcanic eruption. So, is there a chance that an eruption could happen in our lifetime? I could say no, but I won't, because this is a volcanic system. I don't know, but I'm very interested in finding out. <laughs> we could have an eruption next year, or we could have to wait many thousands of years to come. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if there was another eruption in my lifetime, but I also wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't. The spectacular features of Yellowstone National Park draw millions of people every year. What few of them realize is that they're inside the crater of the world's largest volcano. A supervolcano. If it erupts, it could trigger the biggest natural disaster in human history. If a super eruption happened tomorrow, the consequences could be catastrophic. An area the size of a continent would be completely devastated. And there would be global effects for years afterwards. Based on specially commissioned research from scientific organizations around the world, this program predicts the sequence of events that would follow a super eruption at Yellowstone. It's not impossible for a future super eruption at Yellowstone to kill more people across the planet than all previous volcanic eruptions put together. And reveals the consequences for America and the rest of the world. We don't train, prepare, or exercise to anything near the scope of this event. We do do some large-scale, multi-state, multi-region exercises for terrorism, biological, nuclear kinds of events. Nothing comes close to the scale and the magnitude of this event. And I hope I never see it in my lifetime.
supervolcanoes are one of nature's rarest and most deadly phenomena. A super eruption is the world's biggest bang. It's a volcanic explosion big enough to dwarf all others and with a reach great enough to affect everyone on the planet. There are about 40 supervolcanoes around the world. Most are extinct. One of the exceptions, however, is the Yellowstone supervolcano. Three times in the ancient past, it has erupted with a force beyond anything mankind has ever witnessed. 2.1 million years ago, 1.3 million years ago, and 640,000 years ago. This cycle suggests that another super eruption may be brewing. It's actually very difficult to say for sure what's happening underneath a, a volcano like Yellowstone. It could be that the next super eruption is another 100,000 years from now, or it could be tomorrow. The key to predicting the behavior of the supervolcano lies beneath the ground, in the magma chamber. This chamber, which is filled with molten rock or magma, is 80 kilometers long, 40 kilometers wide, and eight kilometers deep. That's almost the size of Yellowstone Park itself. There's more than enough magma down there to fuel another super eruption. So what could set it off? A really big eruption of this kind could probably take place by new magma coming in from much greater depths in the Earth, coming into the magma chamber and increasing the pressure, and that pressure is enough to make the rocks f fail and the magma get to the surface and erupt. Professor Steve Sparks is studying ways to simulate this process. We're never going to get inside an erupting volcano. But what we can do is we can go into the laboratory. And so although they're on different scale and with different liquids, we can gain tremendous insights into how nature behaves. By reproducing in the lab conditions underground, it's possible to see what happens when vast quantities of gas are trapped inside the magma under pressure. What happens at the beginning of a super eruption is that the pressure builds up in the magma chamber and then the roof of the magma chamber cracks. And the magma, with all these bubbles in, reaches the Earth's surface. It spontaneously disintegrates and explodes. And that's really why we get such dramatically violent explosive eruptions in supervolcanoes. The nature of explosive eruptions and the damage they inflict was poorly understood until one day in 1980. Mount St. Helens was the biggest explosive eruption America had ever witnessed. It provided scientists with valuable data that when scaled up can be applied to a super eruption. When a supervolcanic eruption starts, the first thing that would happen would be a cloud of volcanic ash that rises in the atmosphere, rather like in Mount St. Helens. Only the activity would be much more intense and much more energetic, so the cloud would probably go to 40 or 50 kilometers above the Earth's surface rather than about 20 as in Mount St. Helens. Scientists have calculated that the force of the Mount St. Helens eruption was equivalent to one Hiroshima bomb exploding every second. A super eruption, however, would be the equivalent of over 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. This force would propel an eruption column of gas and ash high into the sky, where the first to be affected would be aircraft. On the evening of the 24th of June, 1982, Captain Eric Moody was the pilot of BA Flight 9, en route from Kuala Lumpur across the Indian Ocean. The first sign of trouble was a spectacular display of an electrical phenomenon called St. Elmo's Fire, usually caused 
by large thunderstorms. I was looking on the, on the radar to see where perhaps this heavy thundercloud was, and I could see nothing. So we were sort of discussing that when the flight engineer who sits in the middle between us uh, sport the whole evening by saying number four engines failed. And then he sport it further by saying number two's gone, number three's gone. And if I delete the expletive, he said, oh, we've lost a lot. We lost all four engines. And that just doesn't happen. Unbeknown to the crew, a volcano in Java had erupted and the plane's flight path led them straight through the eruption column, which had triggered not just St. Elmo's fire, but total engine failure. Volcanic ash and commercial aircraft just don't mix. The reason for that is that the ash gets into the aircraft engines. When the pilots find that they're in an ash cloud, they try and climb above it. That means they have to put power on. It heats up the engines. It melts the ash into the turbine blades, and they stop. I said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a small problem. All four engines have failed. We're doing our utmost to get them going. I trust you're not in too much distress. I'd have been terrified if I'd been downstairs. After free falling for 12 nail biting minutes, the plane finally emerged from the ash cloud. We'd come down to around about 12 and a half thousand feet from 37,000 feet. A number four engine, the first one that had failed, started. And it took a minute and a half before number three started up. So we're beginning to think there's light at the end of the tunnel. And then about 20 seconds after that, one and two started up together. As Eric guided the plane down for an emergency landing, he discovered yet another problem. It wasn't until we'd actually got down towards the, the city of Jakarta that I realized that the windscreen ha had gone opaque. Because volcanic ash particles are sharp and abrasive, they had effectively sandblasted the cockpit window. The only bit that we could uh, see out of was a two-inch strip down each side of my uh, extreme left or the extreme right of the first officer's window. And I flew the aeroplane standing up. And then we got to about 100 feet over the end of the runway. I sat down quickly to my straps up and said to the other two, we're not going to die now. And the aeroplane almost landed itself. It just kissed the earth. It was wonderful. Thousands of planes fly through American airspace every day. A Yellowstone super eruption would not just jeopardize their safety, it would ground all flights for months because of the sheer volume of volcanic debris that would be erupted. First Yellowstone super eruption ejected over two and a half thousand cubic kilometers of debris. Now, Mount St. Helens here was about one cubic kilometre, so we're dealing with something two and a half thousand times bigger. It's, it's almost unimaginable. The devastation caused by Mount St. Helens covered an area of approximately 600 square kilometres. Our experts predict that the fallout from a super eruption at Yellowstone would affect nearly three quarters of the United States. To find out how America would deal with a disaster of such colossal scale, we consulted with the organization who would be responsible for trying to control the disaster, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Our mission is to lead America in preparing for, responding to, and recovering from disasters. To date, the biggest emergency FEMA have had to coordinate was the rescue operation following the 9-11 attacks on New York City in 2001. 9-11, or ground zero as we refer to it, it covered approximately 16 acres, uh, less than a tenth of a kilometer, uh, with 1.8 billion tons of debris. Uh, as I understand, the impacts of the Yellowstone eruption uh, were talking about 10 million times the size of ground zero and certainly would be by far bigger than anything that we've ever responded to. It, it's just beyond anything comprehensible. To help them plan and prepare for the impact of an impending disaster, FEMA use a powerful computer model known as Hazus. Hazus. 
Pazis is a predictive modeling tool. What it does is give us um, a prediction of the overall impacts that a disaster may have on homes, critical infrastructure, hospitals, roads. We can then make deliberate decisions and focus our resources and our capabilities to that specific event. Based on data gathered from previous Yellowstone super eruptions, we provided FEMA with a map depicting the projected fallout from an eruption on a similar scale. They programmed this information into hazards to calculate the risk to human life within a series of zones across the United States. Zone one is the pyroclastic zone. Pyroclastic surges are the most deadly product of an explosive eruption. They occur when the pressure propelling the eruption column high into the air dips for just a second, causing part of the column to spill from the side of the volcano in a racing, burning avalanche. Pyroclastic flows they're formed during explosive eruptions, and they consist of very high temperature mixtures of scorching volcanic gas and very hot ash, which blasts across the, the surface of the Earth at velocities which can actually exceed the speed of sound. So these are truly devastating phenomena. Pyroclastic surges from the Mount St. Helens eruption destroyed everything within a 28-kilometer radius of the volcano. The surges from a super eruption at Yellowstone could extend up to 100 kilometers from the volcano, annihilating an area of 10,000 square kilometers and posing a devastating threat to everyone who lives there. Dr. Peter Baxter is familiar with the appalling injuries that can be sustained by victims of pyroclastic surges. With these very large pyroclastic flows, they would be virtually unsurvivable. Or where people have been caught in the intense heat, over 400 degrees centigrade, the body starts to cook very quickly. There's a mixture of burns in the skin, and many of them are deep thickness, so that the parts of the skin are actually carbonized. In severe cases, the body can be almost destroyed in the heat, apart from the bones. Based on the information Provided by FEMA, Dr. Baxter and a team of other experts were able to calculate the potential death toll within the pyroclastic zone. In the worst scenario, people cannot survive in a pyroclastic flow because the forces are so great. And people caught outside, for example, have very little chance of uh, living through the experience. Approximately 87,000 people could be killed by pyroclastic flows. That's a mortality rate of 90%. Devastating though these figures are, they pale into insignificance when Yellowstone's ash cloud begins to spread. This is, this is hell on earth I'm walking through. <coughs> this man was caught under the ash cloud from the Mount St. Helens eruption. Step at a time, I can just keep walking. Against all odds, he survived to tell the tale. Volcanic ash is a, is a rather innocuous looking substance. It's not a spectacular hazard like pyroclastic flows or lava flows, but it's extremely damaging and it can cause all sorts of problems. In an exclusive piece of research commissioned by the BBC, the UK Met Office ran a model simulating the ash fallout from a future Yellowstone super eruption. The results showed that in just a few days, the ash fall would not just extend across the USA, a very fine layer would even reach Europe. The greatest danger, though, faces anyone caught within a thousand kilometers of the volcano, where the ash 
is at its thickest. When the ash level starts to get beyond uh, six inches or 15 centimeters, then the loading on the roofs can become too great and the roofs start to cave in. Many houses would collapse and we would predict if people weren't warned in advance that say one in three people in, in houses where the roofs collapse, they could be killed or seriously injured. This would be the main cause of death in the area around uh, Yellowstone where the ashfall exceeded, say, 60 centimeters depth. Our projections suggest that hundreds of thousands of people would die, either from roof collapse or through suffocation from inhaling fine ash, if they're caught out in the open. Further away from the volcano, even tiny amounts of ash can bring disaster. The ash gets into computers. It can affect transport can bring down power lines. It can contaminate water. It can damage crops. It can cause livestock to die. It can really be incredibly disruptive. Ash can also play havoc with the weather. The tiny ash particles trigger rainfall, turning ash on the ground into mud flows, known as lahars. In 1985, in Colombia, Lahars killed over 23,000 people. Lahars produced by a super eruption would be on an altogether different scale. According to Hazus, the total death toll due to ash related causes would be approximately half a million. But there's another much more insidious way that volcanic ash can kill. The evidence comes from a little known eruption that took place in Iceland. In 1783 in Larki, a huge rip over 25 kilometers long opened up and spewed out lava for seven whole months. While this was a very different type of volcanic eruption to Yellowstone, it's a useful comparison because of its scale. A powerful way of understanding the impacts of big eruptions on the environment is to look at relatively recent big eruptions. And the Lackey Fissure is one of the biggest eruptions of the past 12,000 years. Dr. John Gratton has been researching the effects of the Lackey eruption using a unique historical record. Well, we know so much about the Larky eruption in Iceland because of a remarkable man, Pastor John Steingrenson, who lived nearby. The impacts of the eruption were almost like Armageddon in this area. In his writings, he portrayed it as such, the judgment of God on his people. Those people who did not have enough undiseased supplies of food to last them through these times of pestilence suffered great pain. Their bodies became bloated, ridges, growths, and bristle appeared on their rib joints, the backs of their hands, their legs, feet, and joints. Sometimes eight, sometimes ten, were buried in a single grave. To find out how they died, archaeologists have recently begun excavating the Larky victims. Once these bones were removed from the graves, they were sent to the UK for detailed analysis by Dr. Peter Baxter. When we took the bones out from the grave, the very first thing we could see was an abnormality in both of the hip bones. In a normal hip bone, this area would be quite smooth. What we're seeing here with these knobbly outgrowths is new bone, which is quite abnormal and the kind of new growth in the bone that we think could be caused by fluorosis. This means that the amount of fluorine they would have been exposed to would have been very high and could actually have contributed to their deaths. The analysis suggests 
that the Larky eruption released vast quantities of fluorine, a highly toxic gas. This caused a condition called fluorosis, where gross deformities form in the bones, killing the victims or crippling them for life. The ashfall from a super eruption at Yellowstone could release extremely high levels of fluorine gas into the atmosphere. But the real risk to humanity comes not from fluorine, but from another volcanic gas. Large explosive eruptions also release sulfur, which forms tiny droplets of sulfuric acid, or aerosols, when they're ejected high into the stratosphere. The stratosphere is the atmosphere above the highest clouds that you can see. And what happens is when a, an eruption occurs and that sulfuric acid gets into the stratosphere, there aren't clouds or water there to actually bring it out. The problem is that it can stay there for years and years. The aerosols create a veil that deflects sunlight away from the Earth, causing temperatures to drop. How dramatic the drop depends on how much is released. This model shows the aerosols generated by a regular-sized eruption. To find out how much aerosols could be released by a super-eruption, scientists look to clues trapped within the ice in Greenland. Ice cores, particularly the ones drilled in Greenland, give a fantastic record of what has happened in the climate over the last 110,000 years. If we look back through the ice cores, we can see every single major volcanic eruption. In one of these ice cores, scientists discovered a sulfur signal bigger than anything they'd ever seen before. By far the biggest volcanic eruption that we see is about 74,000 years ago. And we believe this is the super eruption that occurred in Toba. This gives us a very good idea of how much sulfuric acid would have been injected into the stratosphere. Toba was the last super eruption to have occurred on the planet. It's been calculated that it ejected over 2,000 million tons of aerosols. Based on this data, the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg has simulated the global effects of a super eruption at Yellowstone. After just three weeks, the aerosols would form a sulfurous cloak around the world, so dense that it would trigger global cooling on a scale never witnessed before. A new simulation from the Met Office shows how dramatic these climate changes would be. After the Yellowstone super eruption, global temperatures would plummet. In the high latitudes over Europe and the USA, temperatures would drop by 12 degrees. In real terms, this would mean that for at least two to three years, there would be snow on the ground throughout almost the whole year, which would ruin crops and cause absolute chaos. Even more shocking, however, is what happens in the tropics where temperatures would drop by up to 15 degrees with devastating consequences. The monsoons in Southeast Asia would fail. These life-giving rains, which are essential for feeding two-fifths of the world's population, would fail, meaning that there would be mass starvation in Southeast Asia. While Yellowstone's geological history suggests that there will be another super eruption at some stage in the future, scientists agree that the chances of it happening in our lifetime are extremely remote. If it were to happen, however, the devastation would be nothing short 
of cataclysmic. So how would humanity survive? When the last super eruption occurred at Toba 74,000 years ago, there weren't many humans on the planet. They may well have been affected, perhaps quite dramatically in terms of, of their numbers being reduced, but they fought back again, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. Now we're dealing with a, a planet of, uh, with a population of six and a half billion people. If a super eruption happened tomorrow, one could argue that human society currently is very vulnerable and ironically, if this eruption had happened in the Dark Ages, it would have had less of an effect than if it happened now. My personal opinion is I have great faith in humanity. I think if something like this did occur, the nations of the planet would pull together because resources would be so limited that they would have to be shared. So I would see this as an opportunity for humanity to show itself in its true light. <laughs>